Dear ones, both the epistle and the gospel today are so full of very deep and rich spiritual meaning for us. One of the things that stood out to me in contemplating this gospel this past week was the concern for which Christ had for the mere physical needs of the people who were following him. Here we have one of the two feedings of thousands by a miraculous multiplication of bread. And while there are many, many spiritual lessons to be learned from this, the the, uh, patristic commentary on this gospel is, is very rich indeed. What struck me was how often it is that we wonder where Christ is in our spiritual life. And we lament feeling that he has departed from us. And yet we read Gospels like this where when people are merely hungry, not starving, not near death, but merely hungry, he shows concern for them so much so that a miracle is performed. If Christ has such concern for the most basic bodily needs of his followers, would he not then also have even greater need or greater concern for the needs of our souls. Another question you could ask that's related is, if Christ knew, as he knows all things, that the people would be hungry, why was it not planned ahead of time to bring extra food? And the answer to that is clear. It's because through this miracle, his glory is revealed. So will he not do the same thing in our spiritual lives? When we feel a deprivation or an absence in our spiritual life, can we not look ahead and predict that somehow, some way, the glory of God will break through and that this is how he will reveal himself to us? So I want to discuss today a multitude of reasons for why it is that we go through periods of spiritual dryness when we feel that Christ is far from us and why it is that he allows us to go through spiritual difficulties A couple little notes before I begin with this list. First, each one of these could be a homily subject in its own. Next week, I'm going to take one of them that I think often confuses people. I won't tell you which one yet, but next week I'm going to take one of them and expand upon it and really focus just on that one. But each one of these requires a little bit of explanation today, but obviously due to time constraints, I can't give a full explanation for each one of them. The second note that I want to make is that in hearing this list, you may have the reaction that many people have when they read the fathers and the spiritual literature of the church, where they hear one of these and they go, oh, I don't like that. But we need a lot of humility. This is what the epistle was about today. We need a great deal of humility when examining the 2,000-year history of the church and the spirituality of the church, that humility demands that we recognize if we don't understand something, if we don't like it, We are the ones who need maturing, not the 2,000-year history of saints. We need to be very careful when we read about the spiritual methods that grace uses in our lives, and we read about these in the saints, not to become judges of grace, judges of God and judges of the saints, but to humbly step back and say, if I don't like something, if it pricks me the wrong way, that's because I have humility, or I I have humbling that I need to undergo, I have growth that I need, I have maturing in the spiritual life that is required. It's not the, again, 2,000-year history of saints in the church that needs to change. I'm the one who needs to change. So, what is going on when we sense great spiritual difficulties in our lives and we don't feel the closeness of Christ and grace? Why would Christ allow us to go through such things? Why is it that we glory, again, as St. Paul said in the epistle, in the cross? How can we look at these periods and actually be grateful from them and benefit from them rather than complain about them and thus be harmed? Here are just some, some of the reasons that we go through spiritual difficulties. First and foremost, when we go through spiritual difficulties and periods in which we feel like grace is not close to us, It deepens our yearning for Christ in the first place. If we live it well, 
what it does is it causes us to desire Christ even more. And we call out to him, not out of routine, not out of obligation, but out of real need. And we begin to recognize how much we need Christ and his grace. And we call out to him more fervently. And our prayer becomes more legitimate and more honest in that way. Next, when we go through spiritual difficulties, you know that it affects your entire life. It's not just a spiritual thing. It's not isolated to simply the spiritual aspect of your life, but your entire life. When you're going through spiritual difficulties, often work and family life, everything is harmed by this. And so what this causes us to do is actually become detached from the false love of this world. We stop enjoying the things that we typically enjoy, and we realize that the only sweetness in life really does come from the spiritual life. So it causes us to fall out of love with the things of this world, a necessary part of our spiritual lives. Third, when we go through difficult spiritual struggles, and yet we continue living the spiritual life regardless, we do what I talked about last week. We begin to live the spiritual life for Christ and for his love as a response to what he's done for us and not for ourselves. So spiritual struggles and difficulties and the feeling of the absence of grace causes us to become less self-focused because now we pray without the good feelings, without the immediate rewards. And if we pray regardless that prayer becomes far more beneficial to us. I finished up this last week the life of St. Gabriel, the fool for Christ of Georgia. And this is one of the things he says, that when prayer becomes difficult and dry, and we don't want to pray, we become tired of it, and we do it anyway, the rewards double or triple, even while we feel that we're not as connected spiritually. Next. When we go through spiritual difficulties, we begin to learn that there is nothing in our power whatsoever, nothing that we can do to remedy the situation. Only Christ can fix it. And what does this do? It increases humility in our lives. It humbles us deeply when we realize just how helpless we actually are spiritually. We need grace, and only by grace, only by grace can we get out of that dark pit. Only by grace can we do any good work or have any good thought. Next, when we go through unwanted, involuntary spiritual suffering and struggles, we therefore increase an asceticism that we otherwise might not have embraced. Perhaps our level of asceticism is rather small. Perhaps we do the bare minimum. When we go through spiritual difficulties, it is a forced asceticism that reaps many benefits that we otherwise might might not have embraced on our own. Next, when we go through these spiritual struggles, we become instructed in the spiritual life. You learn how to fight against the passions. You fight against lust, against gluttony, against anger. And thus you become a more skilled warrior. There's no way to become a good soldier of Christ unless we are tested. And if the general stands by our side all the time and tells us what to do and intervenes for us at every moment, we don't grow as soldiers. So how do we become a more skilled warrior? Christ takes a step back. And thus we have to engage in the spiritual life more consciously and more wisely, utilizing the writings of the fathers and utilizing the skills that they gave us, that they teach us. And thus we become more skilled warriors ourselves. Next, in the spiritual life, sometimes Christ, we sense his departure, he never really departs, but we sense his departure because it's a period of testing for us. You saw this in the life of St. Anthony the Great, who when the demons appeared to him as various beasts and wild animals, they beat him and he asked, Lord, where were you during this time? And the cave above him opened up with light and Christ appeared to him. And Christ told him, Anthony, I was always with you, but I wanted to see how you would fare. It was a testing, just like with Job. Next, when we go through difficult periods spiritually, especially when they're lengthy, we learn to break our addiction to instant gratification. 
Our culture is absolutely obsessed and awash with instant gratification at every moment. And we don't realize that we take that spirit of instant gratification and, and bring it into our spiritual lives. If prayer feels good at the moment, we'll do it. If it doesn't feel good, we won't. When we go through long spiritual tri- trials, we learn to become long-suffering and to endure lengthy periods rather than looking for instant rewards all the time. And it's the rewards that are hard fought and take many, many months to gain that are the most beneficial. These are the greatest rewards. Small rewards come quickly. Great rewards come over time. This is true both in secular life and in the spiritual life. Next, in the suffering that we endure, that suffering itself purifies our heart of passions. And through this, through this, we find forgiveness of sins. Next, as we endure the suffering of spiritual trials for long periods, God willing, if we do it well, we become more compassionate to others in their spiritual trials. And thus we become a greater aid to them. When they begin complaining about going through similar trials, we can say, I understand. I've been through the same thing. This is what helped me. How can I help you? And finally... If we're giving too great a spiritual trial to begin with, it will break us. So we must be given smaller trials that lead up to the bigger ones so that we can be strengthened over time. Again, it's the same physically. How do you learn to lift weights that you can't lift yet? You lift smaller weights. And little by little, in the suffering of working out, you tear those muscles, they rebuild. You tear them again, they rebuild. And eventually you get to the point where you can lift the weights that before you couldn't even get off the ground one inch. Spiritually, We become strengthened for greater trials by being tested in smaller ones before that and working through them. That's, I think, 11 that I counted. That's 11 reasons why it is that we are put through difficult spiritual trials and difficulties. And if we recognize even some of these benefits, then we don't endure such trials with bitterness, but rather we endure them with gratitude and a renewed sense of purpose. And this is what gets us through them. I want to end by telling you a little story of what happened this past weekend and the life of a saint that I am guessing most of you have not heard of. On Friday, I opened up a drawer in my room that contains a bunch of booklets of services, uh, paraclesi services, akathists, And I've got probably a dozen in there to different saints. And I felt this really strong urge. This was Friday night. I felt this really strong urge to take out the Akathist to a saint that I've never, I've actually never done this service before. But I had his icon in, not in my office, but in the other office downstairs. And I've never felt this urge before, but I I really felt strongly to take out the Akathist to St. George the Pilgrim who's a Romanian saint, and this is the booklet. And I, I, I just had this, this really strong push inside of me that was telling me, bring this to church tomorrow and do the Akathis tomorrow. Do the Akathis to St. George tomorrow. I didn't... I'll show you, by the way. I didn't really know much about St. George when I got this icon. I got this icon because Presbytero was at a monastery at St. Paisios down in Arizona, and she sent me pictures of some of the things in their bookstore and said, you want me to get anything? And I said, I have no idea who that icon is of, but get it. Get it. And so she got it. And this is the icon I have down in the office, St. George the Pilgrim. It's a really beautiful icon, kind of a tile. So out of the blue, Friday night, I had this sense, take the Akathist and, and, and do it tomorrow. Last night I discovered, when is St. George's feast day? August 17th yesterday. So I want to tell you a little bit about his life because it, it applies directly to what we're talking about. If, if you were to see a picture, and I'm going to show you in a second, of St. George, the pilgrim of Romania, uh, he looks like he's an actor in a play. You look at him and think, this can't be a real person. He had a, a, a coat that was just all raggedy and shabby, walked around with no shoes, you can tell which one he is of these two people. This is St. George. 
looks straight out of a out of a play. St. George was born in the 1800s, and when he was 24, he married, and he ended up having, I read two different accounts, one said four kids, one said five. I suspect he had five, but one of them might have died in childbirth. After about 13 or 14 years of marriage, he asked his wife for a blessing to leave and go to the Holy Land and go on an extended pilgrimage. And she prayed about it and agreed to let him go. And so he went to the Holy Land and he venerated the holy sites. Every day for 10 days, he would go to the Holy Sepulchre three times a day for the services. And while there, he visited many other holy sites. And he felt a great push to deepen his spiritual life. So he wrote to his wife and said, wife and said can I extend my stay? Can I go to Mount Athos? Not for a month, but for years, for a few years. And she said, go, go with my blessing. So he went. He went to Mount Athos, and for three years, he learned the ascetic life, absolutely overflowing with love for Christ. And he began to work as hard as he could to practice pure prayer and to learn unceasing prayer. For many years, he struggled with this until almost in despair that he felt like he wasn't making progress. One day, he went to venerate an icon of the Panagia, and he begged her for the gift of unceasing prayer, and he felt grace flow out of this icon through his body, and his whole body became warm. And suddenly he had unceasing prayer of the heart. His body would remain warm so much so that he would spend winters out in snow, and people would be shocked that he didn't freeze to death, and when they felt him, they said his body was always radiating in heat. He went back to the Holy Land where he went up to a mountain, and he decided to fast and pray for 40 days. During those 40 days, the devil appeared to him multiple times. And the devil began to harass him in whatever way he could. The devil realized that spiritual attacks weren't working, and so the devil decided just simply to annoy him and see if he could fall, make him fall into despair. And one of the ways that he annoyed him was one day he walked up to him and he knocked off his shoes and knocked off his hat. And listen to how St. George dealt with this annoyance of the devil. Rather than going to get his hat and his shoes, which he knew the devil could just knock off again and again and put him in despair, St. George said, Oh, what a wonderful opportunity to increase my asceticism. From now on, for the rest of my life, no matter how hot it is, no matter how cold it is, no shoes, no hat, that's it. And from that one little annoyance of the devil, he took this as a spiritual opportunity. And for the rest of his life, he walked around without feet, or without feet, without shoes. <laughs> That's a different ascetic <laughs> endeavor. Without shoes and without a hat. He eventually went back to Romania, and he went to a town near his hometown, and he climbed into their tower. Many of the towns in Romania have these uh, bell towers. And for 25 years, he never left that tower. For 25 years, he lived in prayer, in fasting, and keeping vigil. He would pray sometimes for 22 to 23 hours in a day. When he slept, he would sleep for no more than three hours. And often it was only two. He eventually became a wonder-working figure. There's a famous story that St. Nic- uh, Saint, I think it was St. Nectarius told her, Saint, uh, excuse me, St. Cleopa of Romania told that there was a young Jewish girl who was in labor for many days and she couldn't give birth and she was near death. And everybody knew, go call George the Pilgrim. Call George the Pilgrim. And so he descended the tower and he went to her house. And all he did was look at her and say, may Christ the Panagia be with you and open your womb. And suddenly, immediately she gave birth. He baptized the child and that woman on the same day or, or, or served as the godparent. He was not a priest himself. There's another famous story where he went to board a train to travel somewhere and it was discovered that he did not have a ticket. And so the conductor told him, you can't come. And he kicked him off the train. But they couldn't get the locomotive to start. And after hours of trying, they attached it to a different locomotive and that too wouldn't start. And pilgrims on the train recognized George. They knew him. And they said, this train will not start until you let him back on, with or without a ticket. And finally, the conductor said, I don't believe you, but fine, let's try it. 
As soon as he stepped foot on that train, everything started and they were able to travel without a problem. This was St. George. St. George the Pilgrim reposed in the year 1916. And uh, just about 10 or so years ago, he was officially glorified by the Romanian Patriarchate. And his relics lie in state in a monastery there. Uh, down at, at St. Paisius Monastery in Arizona, they have a small piece of his relics. Uh, they've also had a larger piece that's traveled around the United States. I tried last year when it was traveling around to get it to come here, but they already had uh, their date set for where it was supposed to go, and it was going to a bunch of Romanian parishes. But St. George is a perfect example of someone who, in the face of every spiritual trial and struggle, he saw and said opportunity. Never once did he complain or blame God for leaving him. Rather, he saw in those periods where grace had departed an opportunity to grow spiritually, to fight even harder, and to increase his struggles. And in doing so, he became a man of unceasing prayer, of prophecy, and a wonder worker. He's a perfect example for us. Not to be weak in the spiritual life and not to complain, but rather to take the spiritual struggles as great opportunities for our growth. May we have the continued intercessions of the Theotokos as we continue to celebrate her Feast of the Dormition, and may we have the intercessions of the great Romanian saint, George the Pilgrim, with us today and always. Amen.